Welcome to Tales of Blue, where I'm delighted to be joined by City Royalty. With well over 400 appearances in the shirt, spanning 11 years, that saw him lead the club out three times at Wembley Finals, a promotion campaign, while being voted Player of the Year twice along the way. A warm welcome to former skipper Paul Power. How are you doing, Paul? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Um, really enjoying life at the moment in retirement in the, in the south of France, so... Uh, I've been here for about nine years, nearly sort of ten years in February, actually. So, uh, yeah, we're having a um, a really enjoyable retirement, basically. Finally, got the feet up. <laughs> right, so Paul, Manchester born and a boyhood blue, I believe. What are your earliest memories of supporting City, and who were Paul Power's idols? Oh uh, well, my uh, both my parents uh, were born in Openshaw, which is a stone's throw from uh, where the ground is now. Um, and um, they were, you know, it was a, a big blue area. I think most of East Manchester, Droylesden, that sort of area, um, were all uh, big city fans, whereas it tended to be the south of Manchester and over towards Altrincham and Sale, and that were all red slight, you know. So, yeah, I was I was sort of born into a, a blue family. I was actually born on... Um, uh, Barmouth Street in uh, in Openshaw. Uh, although my mum and dad then um, moved when they got married, and and uh, they, they, my I've got an older sister. Um, she's a year older than me, and then we all moved down to uh, Woodhouse Park in Withenshaw into a new onto a new council estate, uh, and that's where I was brought up. Right. So what kind of who were who were your city idols? What players did Paul Power as a young man pretend to be? Oh well, I was I was brought up in the Belly Somerville era era, and he, slightly before that, um, uh, you know, like, like Cliff Sear, yeah, and um, and, and, uh, and a sort of uh, George Hanna and that that sort of era, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, really, I sort of started going to watch. Games and get interested when um, uh, when the Belly Summerbird era came around. But my favourite player wasn't at any of those three. It was actually Neil Young. I uh, right. uh, I absolutely loved Neil because I was a, a left footer. I was I played uh, left wing for the school team, uh, so you know it was only natural to um, to sort of try and emulate the sort of things that he did. But to be fair, he was a a tall, elegant, um, sort of creative player. I, I was never really that. I was like a, more of a hard-working, yeah. um, up and downer. You know what I mean? But uh, I did, I did appreciate uh, so watching some of the things that he did. And, it, and my dad went to the uh, FA Cup final in '69 when he scored the winning goal. Yeah. Uh, I watched it on the telly at home, but. Um, yeah, I mean, all, all that era was uh, was fantastic. David Connor used to live down the road from me and with him, sure, you know, and he was, uh, I sort of walked past his house hoping that I'd go and see him every now and then. But, um, yeah, so so then we moved from um, sort of um, one part of Withenshaw to another, a little bit nearer, uh, Oatlands Road. Uh, and, and that's where I was when um, I, w I used to play for a, a Sunday league team called uh, West Park Albion because we used to play in Withenshire Park, which was uh, which was west uh, west of Manchester sort of thing. So uh, I played for a team called West Park Albion. It was run by a fellow called Des Rowe, and he sort of uh, went around a few of the primary schools, sort of handpicked some of the uh, good young players that played there, and put a Sunday team together. So. Um, so I used to play on Saturday for the school. Uh, the, the the secondary school I went to was uh, Saint Augustine's in uh, in Sharston, and then um, and then we'd, I'd play on Sunday at Windsor Park for West Park uh, West Park Albion. That was uh, uh, that was my weekend sorted really. Yeah. So you, you end up joining City as a schoolboy, 1973, I believe. What was the path that led you to the club, Paul? Who was influential and in taking you to City? Uh, well, um, without doubt, the the, uh, the instigator of my uh, introduction to City was uh, Harry Godwin, who was 
the chief scout at the time was responsible for bringing number of players through, yeah. All those uh, local players, Alan Oakes, Glenn Pardo, Joe Corrigan, Tommy Booth, uh, Kenny Clements. You know, I mean, it, it, in those days, City was Manchester City because every, pretty much everybody uh, came from Manchester. It was, uh, I remember when we played in the, the League Cup semi final in 1976 against Middlesbrough, uh, there were 10 players. I think there was only Asa who. Um, who wasn't from Manchester, you know? So th- though then we had like Gary Owen and Peter Barnes, and yeah. Uh, so so yeah, he was responsible for bringing a lot of local talent uh, talent into the club. So when you join the club, I mean, it's literally littered with superstar names that you've you've mentioned, like to Neil Young, Colin Bell, Mike Summerby, were all at the club. But what was it like, Paul, for a young schoolboy yourself at the time coming into the club with all these big names and names you grew up watching? Well, it didn't quite work out that way. I didn't, I didn't meet any of those players who were my heroes uh, because uh, Harry, Harry came to meet my dad at, uh, at home. So I was playing for West Park Albion in a semi-final of a Sunday League trophy uh, in Middleton in North Manchester, which is where Harry um, sort of uh, lived. And he, he, would, he just walked across to the playing fields on a Sunday afternoon Watch this game. Uh, obviously, he's quite impressed with the way I played because he approached uh, Des Rowe, our manager, and and said, um, you know, would he be interested in coming down to Main Road? And uh, Des said, well, I'm sure he would be because he's a blue. Yeah. So um, so he said, well, can I speak to him after the game? And my mum and dad weren't at the game. So I um, I spoke with him and I, he said, well, I'll, I'll come to your house tomorrow night and we'll... Uh, I'll have a chat with your mum and dad and we'll, you know, we'll see what happens. So anyway, my dad was working, he used to work at uh, uh, an electrical and uh, metal accessories in Sharston. And he went for a pint with his mate after work. Uh, so Harry came to the house. Uh, my mum said, oh, he's at, the, he's at the, the cock of the north, the pub down at the end of the road. So Harry went down there, met my dad, agreed that I should, uh, you know, go down to meet to have a look around the club initially. Uh, and the day I actually went to see the club, um, he took me into the dressing room and uh, Malcolm Allison and Joe Mercer were sitting there absolutely stark as just a, a towel covering the, uh, the the sort of modesty, if you like. I'd never even seen my mum and dad naked, you know what I mean? So <laughs> It's quite an introduction. Here, here am I, 13, 14-year-old. And uh, Harry introduced me, and and uh, and and Big Mal got uh, got dressed. He just come up. He just come out of the shower. He put his kit on. He said, "Right, come on out." Took me out onto Main Road, like you know, which uh, I wasn't expecting. Yeah. Uh, so I got some kit on, and uh, he had me running up and down the line with a ball. And uh, he said, "You don't use your right foot very much, do you?" You know, and I, well, he could have seen me when I was thirty six, and he would have still been saying the same <laughs> thing, no doubt. But um, uh, that was my introduction, um, you know, to to the football club. And then I used to I used to go. We used to train at Cheadle Town uh, Football Club in those days, and um, I used to go to school at Saint Augustine's in Sharston. So I'd cycle to school in the morning, finish it by half three, four o'clock, whenever. Did my homework, and then and then I used to cycle on to Cheadle um, to to train. Uh, at Cheadle Town and used to be there for about six o'clock, trained for a couple of hours, which wasn't, you know, very inspirational training. Uh, we had two coaches called Dick and Fred who were a little bit senior coaches. Um, and uh, I was about 14. The B team then was like under 16s and the A team was under 18s. Yeah. So, so most of these players would have been B team players. But I was tiny. I was a little left winger. And um, I used to do all the running up and down the stands at Cheadle Town and everything. And uh, uh, and then at the end of the at the end of the training session, uh, they picked two teams. And of course, I was too small to be uh, to be introduced at that age. So I, I never really got to play a game. So I got disillusioned um, by 
you know, cycling to training, having yeah. to cycle from Cheadle back to Withenshaw, which, you know, uh, sort of at nine o'clock at night was uh, uh, not an enjoyable thing to do. And I was absolutely shattered, you know. Yeah. So I, I became a little bit disillusioned and I, and then I stopped, um, I just stopped going, my decision really. And uh, that was, I, I would have been about 15 when I, when I stopped going. When I was 17, I played for Manchester Boys under 18s team and we were playing against uh, uh, a team, uh, Ayrshire Boys from Scotland. And by this time I shot up a little bit. I was a, okay. I was a little bit more, I was a bit more the, the build of uh, Neil Young, really tall and slim, long legged, you know. And uh, and Harry Godwin was watching this game uh, again and came to me and said, "You must come down again, and uh, you know we'll uh, we'll have another look at you." And uh, so that was it. I had a sort of second bite of the cherry, if you like. Yeah. Um, but uh, never looked back after that. I was with I was with City then until I was thirty three years old, basically. Yeah. So who 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 give you the best earliest bit of advice was given to a young Paul one that Paul Young, sorry, that Paul Powell that you might still remember now, or that was given to you as a young schoolboy at City? Uh well when when I um I went to university, uh, so when, when Harry Godwin had seen me, I'd I'd just sort of completed my A levels. And I'd always promised my mum, who was uh, more the intellectual side, my dad wanted to be a footballer, like, you know, he wanted me to be a footballer. My mum wanted me to be a doctor, but uh, I was crap at sciences, so I studied law at, uh, at university. And um, I promised her that if I, if I passed at the end of each year of my law exams, I would carry on till the end. Um, so I never actually played for City during that three-year period at, at university. I played for the reserves regularly. I played with um, um, Glimpardo, who was coming back from that horrendous injury yeah. that he suffered. Uh, and uh, so he was playing at left back and I was playing in front of him, like, you know. Uh, so he gave me loads of good advice, good tips uh, while we were playing. Um, but the best advice I got, really, was from... My coach at the time was uh, Dave Ewing, who, who was yeah. a, a City legend himself in the 50s. Half, yeah. uh, I mean, my mum and dad used to say, they, they used to call him pull up at Dave's because no one no one ever went past him, like, you know. So uh, he was a big Scottish centre half. Frightened me to death, you know, because he, uh, he, he was very vociferous. And, of course, me playing on the left side, um, I was right in front of the box where he sat. And it was like, because I was the nearest player to him, he just shouted my name all the time, Paul Power, Paul Power. And uh, and I was a student, like, and, you know, not used to um, that sort of domineering influence. And uh, and I just turned around to him and I said, Dave, why don't you just leave me alone? <laughs> and uh, and he did. And I'm not, I, I was like, I thought, oh, I wish he hadn't said that because I was more frightened when he didn't shout at me. Like, yeah. you know, uh, I thought I'd upset him. Anyway, I got changed after the game and then I was walking out um, to get the train back to Leeds where, where I went, where I was studying at Leeds Polytechnic. And he followed me down the corridor uh, and he went, hey, hey, come here. He said, uh, he said, as long as I'm having a go at you, you've got a chance at this football club. When I stop having a go at you, your chance is finished. So I'm just letting you know that, you know. So uh, that settled me down a little bit. Yeah. I didn't mind then, you know, when, when he was uh, when he was bawling and shouting at me. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was, that was the best advice, sort of settled me down a little bit, you know. And, uh, uh, and then after that, of course, it was... I got advice from everyone, Malcolm Allison, uh, John Bond, you know, regarding contracts and yeah. and finances and everything, uh, which really at, at this juncture, uh, because Johnny Hart was uh, was the manager when I uh, when I signed sort of uh, amateur um, amateur forms, um, and in fact uh, the, there was a a director at the club called Mr Muir, Chris Muir. He was in charge. He was the director in charge of youth, and um, 
a couple of years before me, uh, Steve Highway had been on the books at City. And then he went to university in Liverpool and he played non-league football. He, he used to, he used to uh, play some games for City. And then he got offered a, an amateur contract. Uh, I think it was Hale, Hale Owen or somewhere like that. It was yeah. a, non-league, a non-league club in, in the Merseyside area. And uh, he, the City missed out on his signature. And then, of course, when he was playing like semi-pro, Liverpool saw him and, it, and he signed for Liverpool. So... I think City didn't want the same thing to happen to me. Right. So they they gave me like a an expenses only semi pro contract sort of thing, you know. And uh, so they used to pay for my expenses to come home from uh, Leeds Poly. And then I used to work on my dad had a pub. So I used to work on the bar on a Friday night, uh, Sunday lunchtime, Saturday night. So, you know, I was earning like quite good money altogether with yeah. uh, being a student. I was quite wealthy as a student. So, uh, um, but then I never actually um, came near to the first team until uh, I completed my degree. And then Tony Book was manager by this time. And uh, he um, asked me to come down to the club to sign uh, to sign professional forms. Of course, I'd played about three seasons, two and a half seasons in the reserves by then, so he knew me really well, and I yeah. also think I also think Glyn Pardo had put in a good word for me, uh, you know, playing with me, yeah. and um, so so I went down to the club. He said he said come and um, uh, come and meet me at eleven o'clock on Thursday. So I've gone down. My dad didn't drive. I got the bus down to uh, Main Road, sat in the reception area, and. Uh, uh, Julia, his secretary, said he'll be with you. He'll be with you, and he's just he's just involved with uh, trying to re-sign Rodney Marsh at the moment, like you know. So I thought, fancy trying to sign Rodney Marsh and ignoring me, like you know, what's it all about? I didn't really, but no, no. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I sort of waited there patiently, and then he came through the reception area, skip, followed by about three members of the press and and Marsh. So, and he said to me, look, son, he says, I'm really sorry. Uh, I'm tied up with this at the moment. I won't have time to speak to you today. Um, you know, go home and I'll get Julia to ring you and we'll make another appointment. He said, but don't worry. You know, you will you will be signing. So I went home and told my mum and dad who were big City fans, like, but I haven't signed after yeah. all. Like, <laughs> A massive anti-climax, but um, well, you'd have known if Tony Book had give you his word, then it, it it would have been true to that for sure. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Skip I mean, was one of, the most, one of the most honest people I've ever met. Yeah, and it's Tony who eventually gives you your city debut, Aston Villa, twenty seventh of August, nineteen seventy five. When did you find out you'd be involved on that day, Paul? And what can you remember of the performance and the experience as a whole on your city debut? Well, I, f- I found out on the. Uh, on the morning of the game, because uh, the the team sheet used to be posted up on the uh, uh, on the dressing room um, sort of notice board, and I looked like I looked at the notice board, and it was like, you know, uh, Stewart, uh, Marsh, Hartford, Power. I thought it just didn't look right. You know, it didn't. It, I couldn't believe that um, that that I was going to get a debut there. Um, so I, I had to quickly go home, uh, get changed and come back to uh, home was at that time um, at the uh, the Wagon and Horses pub in uh, in Salford. And uh, so it was two buses, you know, one, one into Manchester yeah. and one out. And then I came back and got the uh, got the team coach and we went to Villa Park. I um, I had a chance we were getting beat 1-0 and I had a chance to equalise late on and I, I sort of lifted it over the keeper but unfortunately over the bar as well. So I think it was a few games uh, after that Villa game that uh, that I actually uh, established myself in the team. I mean, you, you have 18 appearances in that breakthrough season plus a couple in the League Cup and since you go on to win the final against Newcastle, you featured in a few of the earlier rounds, Paul. Were you close to making the squad for the final and did you travel down on the day? 
Yeah, yeah, I was uh, I was due to be uh, sub. It, uh, I've been told that I would be sub um, for the Wembley game, and then, uh, but I had a I had an injury, and um, I thought I could risk just sitting on the bench and not being needed. But if there was only one sub in those days, sure. and uh, I thought, well, if if I was uh, called upon after 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I don't think, I think it was an ankle or it would have been an ankle or a knee injury because I, I never injured anything else really. Um, and uh, and I, I decided that, you know, I wasn't 100% fit to to uh, to even sit on the bench if, uh, if I'd have been needed early on. So uh, I told Skip that I wasn't ready and uh, I think Jed Keegan sat on the bench that day um and uh yeah just uh, really unfortunate but uh i enjoyed the uh, the two semi finals against middlesbrough yeah um you know it was great great to be involved in at such an early point in my career uh and then of course i went down with the with the squad i uh, i invited a couple of my mates a lad who, who was my best man from uh from university, uh, who was a Yorkshire lad, Stan. He came down with uh, with his mate, and we sort of shared a room, you know, at the hotel and everything. So it was great to have a couple of students in my room and uh, and, and give them a little taste of the high life as well, like you know. I mean, you, you firmly established yourself as a first team player from the 76, 77 season onwards. In what was a great period of football for City, exciting players, European Cup ties, title challenges. How was Paul Power enjoying life as a professional Manchester City player? Yeah, yeah, I absolutely loved it. I mean, it, you know, it was my best mate was Kenny Clements. Um, we roomed, we roomed together. We uh, we made our debuts together against Aston Villa. Yeah. Uh, we were. Um, like bosom buddies, really. You know, wherever we went, we roomed together. We were the uh, we were the two young players in the team. Similar, you know, Kenny was a groundsman at, at uh, Cheadle Town, um, so the club gave him a job at Cheadle, and um, he used to prepare the ground and everything. I was at university. Uh, Kenny used to do his job, and then he'd train every day because the first team used to train at Cheadle Town as well. Like you know, so. Whereas I was away, uh, the only time I'd come back would be perhaps uh, if there was a midweek, um, if there was a midweek reserve team game, I'd come back and play in that. Otherwise, I would I would represent the law the law department in the uh, interdepartmental tournament uh, that was held at Leeds Poly. Uh, so that was the only football I got apart from Monday morning um, when I didn't have any lectures. So I used to go and train, and we always used to train at Withenshire Park on a Monday morning. It was a physical morning. Just uh, there was a running track at Withenshire Park, uh, and then I'd be, you know, I'd be training because everybody trained together. So there'd be people, yeah. you know, like Belly uh, and uh, Neil Young had, had gone by then. Uh, Franny and Mike Summerby had gone by then, um, but you know, all these like good runners like uh, Colin Barrett and. Uh, Frank Calidus was a good runner at that uh, during that period, and all you know we, we used to train with them. And I was I was never at the front, but I was never at the back, you know. So so with uh, but but that was a great um, session for me because it kept my fitness levels up. Yeah, sure. And then I'd play on a Wednesday afternoon, come back on a Friday to play. The reserves used to play on a Saturday that night, you know. Uh, and we had a we had a real good squad of people. Uh, not just good players. If you remember Mike Lester, who they signed from, uh, they signed from Oldham. Uh, but I, I used to, I used to play against Mike. Uh, he's a, he's the same age as me, uh, but he played for Saint Gregory's, and I I went to a Catholic school. He went to a Catholic school. We used to play against each other in the Manchester Catholics, you know. And uh, uh, and then Dennis Lehman, uh, who had a good career in football, and then I went to work with him later on in the community programme in, in professional football after my football career had finished. Um, and Jed Keegan, I mentioned Kenny Clements. You know, there were there were loads of good lads in the in the squad at that time. And we we won the Central League uh, one particular year. So there was a nice 
camaraderie as well. Yeah, sure. So November 1978, Paul sees you score at the famous San Siro Stadium, with City coming close to being the first English team to win there. He settled for a draw. This was the shirt, the number six. I was showing you earlier that you wore that afternoon. Yeah, yeah. What are the memories of that day and to score in such an iconic stadium? Oh, uh, unbe unbelievable, really, because we were supposed to play on the Wednesday evening. That's right, yeah. And, uh, and uh, this this... Incredible fog just defended, uh, just descended. We went out to look at the pitch, and we could see the top of the stand at the San Siro, and uh, there were a load of supporters in the ground even then, like you know, an hour or so before the game. They were making a noise. It was quite intimidatory. When when we then came out to warm up, and this fog uh, had descended, and we were told that the game might not be played. Anyway, we warmed up. Um, and then we could, I could hear this noise and there were all fires, almost fires that, that, that were being lit in the top of the stand, maybe so that they could see the pitch or whatever. Uh, uh, but it was really intimidating, yes. the noise. And uh, anyway, we, we went back in the dressing room. They told us that the game was uh, going to be called off and it would be played the following day. So, um, so we, uh, we played on the Thursday afternoon and then... Of course, the, the stadium was half empty because people were at work. You know, it was a, a, a Thursday afternoon. They wouldn't have been able to get the time off work. So the atmosphere wasn't nearly as intimidating as it had been the night before. And, uh, and we ended up, um, we ended up um, drawing the game too all. But I, I got the ball on the edge of our penalty area and I just ran with it. And uh, the, it was so open, I, could, I sort of ran down the right-hand side of the pitch. And um, Mancini was, uh, not Mancini, what was the name of the, Maldini, sorry. Yeah. Uh, was was, the, was a, a young 17-year-old uh, fullback. He was left fullback. It went on to become uh, an AC Milan legend. Um, but at this time, he was only 17, so... On. I'm sort of running the ball just to, towards the edge of the 18-yard box. And I cut inside him onto my left foot. And then I just went for it, really. You know, I, I played with Brian Kidd. In fact, Brian Kidd scored that day. And Kiddo always used to say, if you don't buy a raffle ticket, yes. you won't win a prize. You know, so that was his saying, like, have a shot. And you never know what might happen. So uh, I decided to have a shot. And the, the, the goalkeeper was a, a, a fella called Albertozzi who was a good goalkeeper, but I think I could have saved the, the shot that, that I'd made. And, um, and then, uh, sort of a couple of seasons later, he was, he was prosecuted for uh, illegal gambling and taking bets on games. And I thought, I bet he had a bloody bet on, on my shot going in as well that day. Like, you know, but but uh, anyway, it was, uh, it was fantastic. We, we drew to all, and then we, we got them back... Um, to main road in the second leg, and we beat them three one. Uh, I think Asa Harford scored that night. And uh, so what was the atmosphere was... like at main road, Paul, on a, on a European night? The atmosphere it was always a bit more of a tingle in the air on the night game at main road. What do you call it, the European nights? Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, and, and especially against a team uh, as fashionable and well known as AC Milan as well. You know, I mean, in the next round we played uh, the German. Um, Munching Gladbach, we played at one stage. Munching Gladbach, yeah. And, um, you know, it, it, it wasn't quite the same. The, 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 the stadium wasn't the same as the San Siro. Uh, it wasn't as uplifting. Uh, they were a more workmanlike side. And, um, you know, it was just... Uh, uh, it was just more hard work playing against them. And, uh, unfortunately, I mean, they had, they had a good side. They had... Um, uh, a, Two or three German internationals. Yeah. Uh, in, well, all in the, the German sides will be strong, wouldn't they? Whatever era we're from, they're always big, strong sides. Yeah, phys physically powerful as well, like you know. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, we we, uh, we we acquitted ourselves quite well, but not not just quite well enough, really, you know. And uh, um, we didn't uh, get through to the late stages, unfortunately. So I want to take you back, Paul, to Boxing Day, nineteen seventy-seven. A certain Colin Bell is summoned 
for the second half as your replacement at half time, I believe, against Newcastle. And May Road witnesses an atmosphere that has gone down in city folklore as the King was back. What do you remember that afternoon and your memories of Colin? Well, no, I, I don't think it was half time, actually. I think they, they, uh, they, it, it was just after half time. Okay. I think it, it was during, during the game. And, um, and uh, they, uh, Skip put the my, my number up, like you know. So Tony put put my number up, and I, so I know I'm coming off. I, as I'm walking off, like all the crowd stood up and started cheering, and I thought, bloody hell, I didn't play that well, you know. <laughs> and then I realised it was because Belly was coming on, uh, you know, for his first appearance after his um, after his injury. But I'd been injured for some time, um, so before before that era, and. Um, we trained together with uh, with Roy Bailey and uh, Freddie Griffiths, a physiotherapist, and uh, he was fantastic. What well, I mean, an absolute, genuine man, a gentleman, never swore. The worst, he, the worst he ever said was "Ruddy," you know, you've got to hit the ruddy target, and we do, and we do um, shooting sessions, and he'd be unbelievable bending balls in and. You know, uh, he was he was just a, an absolute inspiration, really. Uh, but but a great bloke, you know, wasn't bothered about young players coming through and threatening his place or anything. As as some senior pros might, as yeah. some senior pros might, uh, he was helpful. Uh, but he he blinking remind you that he was uh, he was still competing for the for the place as well because I I remember when we we, we trained. In the gym at Main Road, we used to, if it was raining or wet or we couldn't get to Cheadle, we'd, we'd uh, train indoors in the indoor gym, the head tennis gym, as it used to be called. And uh, we'd play skittleball, and, and Dave Ewing would join in. You know, he could hardly run that, but he used to stand on that bloody skittle and you couldn't ever hit it because he was massive, like, you know. Uh, but then the ball would go up against the wall, and uh, me being a, a bit of a naive student, uh, would go and go, try and be first to the ball, you know, and it, so it'd be the wall, the ball, and me, and then whack, like you know, someone has smacked you up against the wall. Anyway, I turned around, it, it was Belly, you know, Belly was uh, training with us, and uh, Dave, I look at Dave Ewing, like, and uh, and he just started laughing, you know, <laughs> and he said to me, he said to me after the game, see, you think Belly's a nice man, don't you? He said, well, when things matter. He can be nasty as well, like you know. So that was another lesson uh, that I learned that maybe I'd have to introduce that into my game somewhere along the line if I were to be successful, you know. Yeah. So yeah, all those all those years of me at college and training with super pros like him, um, you know, were great for my development, really. Certainly, a, a unique man, player, and, and you know the words you said, fantastic. 1979 sees you take over the city captaincy, age 26. Tell us, Paul, what that meant to you on a personal level at that time. Um, it was totally unexpected, to be fair. I mean, there were there were players in the squad who should have been uh, asked to be captain before me. People like Dennis Stewart and Joe Corrigan and like senior pros, more senior than me. Uh, but for some reason, I, I know uh, Big Mal loved athletes. You know, he uh, he he's, um, he was very much into East European football, where they developed uh, athletes, people that could ping the ball from one side of the pitch to the other and change the uh, change the the uh, pattern of play quickly. Uh, and I think maybe just because I had a law degree and I was sensible around the dressing room. Uh, he, he decided to take a, a bit of a gamble on me, really, you know, and uh, obviously I was absolutely made up. It was um, it, it was an absolute honour for me, um, you know, to uh, uh, to lead the team out at Main Road. And obviously that led uh, eventually to me leading the team out at Wembley, which was the biggest honour, uh, the best moment in my career, really. Big Mal returns to the club in 1979. Tony Book moves aside, or upstairs, as they call it. 
Of course, we all know the story about the players' sales, etc. of Allison's second coming. But what do you remember of that period, Paul, what, with mass changes going on, which many felt at the time it probably wasn't needed, especially player-wise? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you see, Mal came, I think, I think Mal came after the after the uh, the AC Milan game. And then before the uh, before the game in Germany. And you know, we had we had good players at the club then, uh, like Kazu Dana. Yeah. Uh, he he brought he brought Kazi in uh, and and also uh, Dragislav Stepanovic, Stepanovic, remember he, yeah. Yugoslav uh, left back and uh, good international players, but but then Mal, I think because of the success he had when he brought Tony Book to the to the club from non-league football, when I think Bucky was playing for Bath City or someone like that uh, down in the West Country, and I think he thought he could do it again. Yeah. And he and he ended up bringing players in like Paul Sugru, David Whiffle, um, all all non-league players, and were. You know, he brought Barry Silkman from Crystal Palace. He, he brought the two uh, little Welsh lads from uh, uh, Bobby Shinton and oh, the other little uh, number nine centre forward. Um, Billy Telford came in at that stage. Who's that, sorry? Billy Telford, was he around that stage? Came in as right. well? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> there was I so many, Paul, the, wasn't there? There was a, <laughs> there was a lot of well, players many, coming and going. Two, too many, really, and he brought Steve Daly in and paid a lot of money for Steve as well, like you know. But uh, he changed the whole dynamic of the team, and uh, he, he he wanted uh, athletes in the team in every position. So people that were good defenders, like Tommy Boo, who was not the quickest, not the greatest athlete, adequate, more than adequate, but um, not you know, not sort of. Uh, up there with the great athletes like Belly and Oki and people that I've mentioned before. So uh, so he, he decided that he wanted to play Tommy Cain and Nicky Reed as, as twin centre-halves. He had this uh, European vision of centre-backs coming out, running the ball out, um, and they had to be good athletes to do that. Uh, Kazu Dana wasn't a good athlete, but unbelievable unbelievable on the ball, you know. Exactly, very good, yeah. I mean, he, he gave me the best coaching lesson that I've ever had. Um, I used to play at left-back, and he, he'd come to play, he'd come to receive the ball. If there was a player tight on him, I never gave him the ball. I used to drop it into the Joe Royal or whoever, kiddo, whoever was the front man, and then, of course, he'd have to spin round and... Uh, and go and support that long ball, and it wasn't his game at all. He said, "Hey," and he just said, "Paul, Paul, Paul, no good, no good." <laughs> he said, "I come to the ball. If there's a man on me, you give it me. I give it you back. If there's no man on it, if there's no man on me, give it me soft, and I'll turn. If there's a man on my right, give it to my left. He said, there's a man on my left, give it to my right.' And that I'd, I'd worked for Malcolm Allison and." Uh, you know, uh, great coaches like uh, um, John Bond, Tony Book and Bill Taylor and people, England international coaches. And no one had ever made the game that simple for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? So Kazi was uh, was a, a, a man on his own. He used to take the mickey out of Joe Corrigan in training sessions. And Joe, he, if you scored against Joe in a, tra in a training session, you tried to chip him or, or yeah. belittle him in some way. He'd chase you and he'd whack you on the arm, like, you know, he's a big bully. But he never, ever chased Kazi because he knew he'd met his match, like, Kazi was just a, a superb finisher. And, uh, yeah, yeah, so, but we had it. So these players were, were moved out because they weren't athletes, even though they were good footballers. Yeah. And then, he, he, you know, he, he brought in these uh, younger players uh, he got rid of Kenny Clements, I think, and Ray Ranson came in at uh, right back. Um, and uh, you know, Acer wasn't it wasn't his flavour of the month. So you know, he brought Steve McKenzie in, didn't he? And you know, uh, so it was. Uh, 
think that's too it, much it was too period, soon, wasn't it? Too much. It was. Too a, it was a period of great uh, change yeah. in the in the players staff, and uh, you know it, it really did upset the balance of the dressing room as well, um, because certain players uh, who thought they should be playing weren't being selected, and they were all getting together and forming a little squad of their own. Yeah. And complaining, and and then the whole atmosphere in the dressing room sort of uh, fell apart. Although the quality on the pitch fell apart as well. Yeah, well, it's all changed again with John Bond arriving in October 1981, and he brings some experienced professionals with him to help steady the ship after all the changes and form improves. Yeah. How was your relationship with John Bond, and how did you call the impact he had on his arrival at City? John Bond was the first manager ever to come to me and say you're not on enough money at this football club he said you're captain of the club and you're not on enough money I'll make sure that I get you a better contract so straight away you think oh and then and then one day there was my, in the dressing room there was myself uh, Tommy Booth and uh, Joe Corrigan and we were all just standing uh, in the dressing room chatting and he came in he went I'm glad you three are here because I'm going to uh, you're going to form the backbone of my team, like you know. And um, he didn't need to say that, but it makes you feel a million dollars yeah, when sure. when you've got that sort of support uh, from the manager. The manager, by the way, John Bond only ever gave you good news. If there was ever bad news to come and you saw Benno, John Benson, if you saw Benno coming towards you, you thought, oh, I'm not playing tonight because right. he was the bearer of bad tidings, you know. Uh, where I, but the three of them uh, used to work. The three Johns. It was John, uh, John Saint. It was the coach. Uh, John Benson, assistant manager. John Bond, manager. The three Johns worked really well together, and they kept the dressing room well together. And he, he, it didn't take him long to suss out that um, you know he, he, he brought Bobby McDonald in at left back, which released me to go and play wide on the left. We were. He brought Tommy Hutchison in. Uh, I think Dennis Stewart had gone by this time to Burnley, I think, uh, or, or maybe even to uh, New York Cosmos. Yeah. But uh, I don't think he was at the club then. Uh, and then Tommy Hutchison came in, of course. And then Jerry Gow uh, Jerry provided uh, a little bit of uh, steel and metal yeah, in the, steel, yeah, in the sure. middle of the park. I mean, we'd, we'd had players like Colin Viljon, who was a lovely footballer. Barry Silkman, a nice footballer, but no aggression, no devil since since Acer, Acer had left. And, uh, yeah. you know, there was nobody who would leave a foot in there in the middle of the park. We had Steve McKenzie, who was a nice footballer. But, you know, he, he just he brought three players in. It, it transformed the whole, whole season. We'd gone from not being able to win for the first 12 games to then not losing almost, you know, uh, and, and we finished mid-table respectability for, for where yeah. John Bond had taken the club over, really. Yeah, considering the start, it was a, it's a great finish to the season. And the FA Cup is the highlight of that season, which, of course, you play a major role in with some fantastic goals along the way. A semi-final winner over the much-fancied Ipswich Town side. What was going through Paul Power's head just before that strike and the celebration and afterwards, Paul? <laughs> well, it's, it's strange, actually, because... Um, at full time in the game, um, we uh, we were getting, we uh, our team was getting ready to um, to play extra time, and uh, Eric Gates uh, came up to me and he had his boots under his arm and he wished wished me all the best, like you know. And uh, I said, uh, I think you'll find there's uh, extra time, you know. And he went, No, it's a replay, isn't it? I said, No, I'm sure it's extra time, like uh, half an hour. So he went, oh, you can have it. So, so I thought, I hope your bloody mates think the same thing, like wow. you know. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Dave Bennett gets fouled sort of round the edge of the eighteen yard area, and the way we used to set up was that Steve McKenzie had knocked the ball to me. If the ball was on the right hand side, he'd knock the ball to me, uh, and then when the player came off the wall to close the ball down. I would then knock it on to Tommy Caton, who'd smack it in with his uh, powerful left foot, you know. Anyway, uh, Steve McKenzie knocked it to me and nobody came off the end of the wall. Who was the player on the end of the wall? 
Eric Gates, he was the one who should have been coming to close the ball down, couldn't be bothered. And so I thought, Brian Kidd's in my mind, you know, if you don't buy a raffle ticket, you don't win a prize. So I, I went for it. Uh, the goalkeeper uh, for Ipswich, Paul Cooper, wasn't the biggest. Uh, and uh, I just bent, I bent it in the top corner, right in front of the uh, whole tent where all the city supporters were. They all went up in the air. I went up in the air. Uh, it was uh, it was a, a fantastic moment, a fantastic moment because we, we weren't fancied. We weren't fancied against uh, Ipswich. A strong side. They were the side, weren't they, to be at the time? Ipswich were a very strong side under Bobby Robson, of course. Yeah, and they but, had. Uh, so if it wasn't for Eric Gates, we wouldn't be talking possibly about that goal then. Well, yeah, or or if uh, Eric Eric Gates would have been a different player and on the pitch, you know. Uh, yeah. But yeah, they had uh, Kevin Beatty and uh, the the two Dutch players, uh, Franz yeah. Tyson, yeah, and Arnold Bjorn. We were we were not expected to win. We, we you know, so it was a it was a shock really. And even my wife's brother, uh, her eldest brother Billy was a big United fan and he'd said to me, if you beat uh, if you beat Ipswich on Saturday, I, I'll come to work at Wembley and I'll wear all blue. Oh. So <laughs> so uh, anyway, on, the, on, on the, the, the day of the cup final, I, I knew where the family tickets were and I, I looked up in the, in the stand and there was Billy, like he had a big blue and white flag, blue <laughs> cap, blue jumper, trousers, all blue. And then he he put his foot up on the on the little on the seat, and he had red socks on. Like so. <laughs> he said, "I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it." But you know, great uh, great times for everybody that uh, successful era. But just wish that I always used to look in in the reception area at Main Road, and there was a picture of Tony Book in that in that kit that, that, that is uh, behind you, black. Black, the black and red kit. And he's hoist on the uh, on the player's shoulders with the cup up in the air. I always wanted that to be me, but unfortunately, it just didn't turn out that way. I mean, how do you look back on the two finals, Paul? With many blues still devastated to this day. I know it's some forty odd years later, but we we were close, in, you know, especially in the first match. So, do you, is it something you still think about? Uh, not really. I don't. I'm, you know, I'm not sentimental like that. But I did think about it for a long time afterwards. Yeah. And then, uh, but the the thing was, we, we knew Glenn Hoddle was a threat at, at uh, set pieces, and um, we'd gone through uh, the routine of lining up the wall. So I I used I'd line up the wall with Joe Corrigan, so uh, wherever the wherever the free kick was. And then Tommy Hutch would be on the other end of the wall. Um, so he gives a little bit of height there in case Glenn Huddle wanted to try and bend it in yeah. uh, over the wall, which he was pretty good at, like, you know. Anyway, Tommy said, well, I'll, I'll drop off the wall. So if it, hits, if it hits the bar or the post, I'll be first to the ball, like, you know. Anyway, we practised that a couple of times. And Joe Corrigan said, Tommy, stay where you are. He said, if he can bend that ball over the wall and uh, and he beats me, then full marks to him. Like, he deserves to score a goal, like, you know. So Joe was confident that with the wall there static, um, you know, we'd, um, we'd do OK. Anyway, Tommy still decided that his idea was best. So he dropped off the wall. Glenn Hoddle, uh, Joe dived to save the uh, the initial shot from Glenn oh. Hoddle. Of course, it hit Tommy on the shoulder and went in the other corner. And he knew as soon as it had happened, yeah. Tom, that, that, and Joe knew, well, he wasn't going to tear a strip off him. You know what I mean? It was, Man, it was just one of those things that had happened. So We needed uh, Tommy Hutch to do an Eric Gates, didn't we, and stay in the hall? <laughs> well, yeah, 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 just stay where he was. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Right, but, yeah. Well, that's you know that's just um, uh, we were we were unlucky uh, not not to win. Have, having beat Ipswich, we fancied ourselves against sure. Spurs, even though even though they had our dealers and Hoddle and uh, Perryman and you know like good good players, we we fancied ourselves against them. And then when we drew, um, I think we put so much into that into that game. Yeah. Um, that. 
we had little left on the on the Thursday when we played uh, the replay, like you know, uh, and we just weren't able. Even even though we went two one up in that game, yeah. And Steve McKenzie scored the one best of the goal. best goals, one of the best goals that's ever been scored at Wembley, and nobody remembers it because wow. Ricky Veer did that little dribble, uh, you know, to win the game for them. Like, but yeah, yeah, so uh, so uh, disappointing, um, and not to win the final. So following John Bond's first full season of 81-82, things start to filter out under Bond and he leaves during the 82-83 campaign and we find ourselves in a dogfight with Luton Town on the last day of the season. What do you remember of that painful afternoon, Paul? Yeah, yeah, again, again, they were, they were off the field uh, situations which contributed to, which contributed to that. I won't, I won't mention the player because it's not fair, but one of our players was having uh, difficulties at the time with with, uh, with his marriage. And um, I got a phone call on uh, on Friday morning uh, from Kevin Bond and he, he said, uh, he said, did, did uh, such and such a girl stay with Julie last night at your house? Like, you know, and I said, I said, no, there's nobody here. Um, and he said, "All oh, right." He said, "Only uh, she didn't turn up at home, and uh, you know, this the the, the player was uh, concerned anyway. Uh, that particular player might as well not been on the pitch that afternoon because oh, okay. because of all the things that had happened in the background, you know. And um, and I think that maybe uh, contributed a little bit to uh, uh, to what happened. I think." Also, the fact that we only needed to draw if we did if we'd have had to win the game, yeah. Um, then you know we'd have, we'd have maybe gone more gung ho at it to try and score uh, to get a goal. Um, but as it turned out, we were quite happy to sit back, and it and then it got to four minutes before the end when uh, when um, the cross came in from my side. Actually, I had not defended particularly well. The cross came in, Alex. Williams uh, sort of half punched it to the edge of the area to Raddy Antic and he smashed it in. Alex dived to save the shot and deflected it past the players on the line who might have saved. So I think it was one of those days where it was obviously going to work against us and work for uh, Brian Horton and his team, like, you know, but um, yeah, yeah, absolutely soul destroying that uh, that day. So Billy McNeil comes in as manager following the relegation. He brings an array of Scottish, Scottish talented players with him as we start life in the second division. With City dropping down a division, Paul, was it ever an option for you to move on? Did any club show of interest in you after being a first division player for so long? Yeah, always. I, I mean, there were there were a couple of... Um, I, used to, I used to read the Sunday People, you know, because they, they seemed to be the, the newspaper that were up to date with clubs being interested in players and okay. uh, I was interested uh, by by uh, Washington diplomats so I, I, you know there was a there was talk about me going over to America uh, Ian McFarland had left city uh, and he was um, he was coached with Tony book uh, when we get to when we got to the League Cup final in 76 he went to Sunderland and wanted to take me with him. You know, there was reports about that. But, but the manager never came and actually spoke to me and said, uh, listen, this is... I didn't have an agent. So it was only um, sort of uh, word of mouth, if you like, yeah. that, uh, uh, that, that, that word came around that other clubs were interested in me. But it never actually happened. Uh, and I, to be fair, I, w I was more than happy to stay at City. It was my team. You know, it'd been the team that I'd supported from being like six or seven years of age. Uh, and then I captained them and I was like more than uh, more than happy uh, to carry on, you know. So, um, yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was my situation. I didn't particularly want to leave. Um, and then Billy McNeil came in. He didn't take the captaincy off me. He... Uh, uh, he was a different type of manager than we'd been used to. He was a, he was very much uh, his nickname was Caesar because his chest was always out here. Uh, he was one of the 
Um, he was the captain of the team that had won the first. He was a big, European. big football name, wasn't he, Billy McNeil, the, the Celtic, yeah, yeah. The Celtic captain. Yeah, yeah. He had a presence about him. And the reason, the reason he bought like players like uh, Derek Parlane and Gordon Smith, uh, who was uh, Jim Melrose, Jim Tolmy. I mean, he, he, every player that he bought was Neil McNabb was another one. They were all Scots. Yeah. So it came to a point in on a Friday morning, pre-season training, and he used to have a, a five-a-side, England against Scotland. Well, that wasn't a good idea. because <laughs> The Scots hated the English anyway. And then we used to kick lumps out of each other and we'd end up having a couple of injuries maybe uh, just out, out from a five-a-side on a, on a Friday morning. But, um, but he was he was very good. He was he was a he was a typical Scottish manager, Tommy Doherty type, yeah. you know, uh, in your face, wouldn't accept uh, excuses for anything. Um, and then uh, eventually, uh, you know, we we uh, we got promotion. Not the first year, but the second year. It was kind of um, a season of consolidation first, Paul, wasn't it, under Billy? Then promotions is sealed the following season, 85, um, 84, 85, beating Charlton 5 1 at a Pac Main Road. What yeah. did you call of that game, Paul? Was there tension before that game? I mean, because the, the promotion push started to get a little rocky, didn't it? A few games before the end of the season, there was a few <laughs> results and it all got a bit heated at a few games. Notts County yeah. away was the defeat, but uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a good season for you personally. You win your second Player of the Year award. But uh, what, what do you remember that afternoon, the Charlton fixture? Um, well, just just uh, because we went into a, a sort of an early lead and a comfortable lead. Uh, I think Andy May scored maybe, and uh, yeah. um, Mick McCarthy might have got one from a. Uh, well, Mick was uh, missing because we had a few out suspended. Clive Wilson was out injured. Mick was suspended. Right. Um, yeah. Young Jeff Lomax came in at right back. I right, yeah, 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 and, um, yeah. Andy May scored. David Phillips got a Paul Simpson, Jim Melrose. That's right. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, okay. so, so, um, you know, it, it was a comfortable afternoon. It wasn't like the uh, the Luton game where, you know, it was nil nil with four minutes to go, and you know, the, the, we we felt the pressure. Uh, the longer the game went on, they could nick a goal, and yeah. and then we'd be relegated. It was never like that against uh, against Charlton because, you know, we went into a comfortable lead. And lead it, was, yeah. it was a nice afternoon after that, like you know, and uh, and a patch so, of main yeah, road. It was uh, it was more relaxed, and and I think because we were relaxed, uh, you know, that came out in the in the performance, uh, and uh, eventually, you know, it was great to uh, uh, to go back where we belonged or where we thought we belonged. In the first division. So we're back up in the first division for the 85-86 campaign. And I want you to take you back, Paul, to a weekend of March the 22nd and 23rd when we play an old Trafford derby on the Saturday, followed by the full Members' Cup final on the Sunday, which was the third time you lead City out as skipper at the Twin Towers. What would you call of that crazy weekend? Well, it just wouldn't happen today. No. You know, that. I mean, we ended up playing Chelsea in the, in, in the full Members' Cup final. Um, and uh, who on earth would you know would have would have played a cup final on the Sunday and then a derby match on the Saturday? So and it was a it was a tight four derby match as well. It wasn't like you know we were we were getting beat easily, and we there was never any prospect of us uh, uh, not giving a hundred percent against oh, yeah. Man United because pride was at stake in the town and everything. Uh, and then um, I can't remember. Did, did did we win that game one 0 or did we draw one all? The Saturday was two two at Old Trafford. Oh two two, sorry, yeah. Yes, so we two, two. so we got the draw. I think Clyde Wilson might have scored anyway. Yeah. But um, but then you know for to play an intense game like that, and then to be expected to turn it in again the following day was nonsense, really. Uh, and I think Chelsea had had a much easier game uh, the day before. So yeah, I think uh, they were at Southampton. They were at Southampton, I think, on the Saturday. Yeah, yeah, and and maybe not expended as much uh, energy either emotionally or physically. Uh, so, um, you know, we we got off to an awful start. I mean, they. I think David Speedy scored 
uh, ridiculously early for them. And then we came into it as the game went on. And Mark Lillis, uh, well, he definitely got two. I think he might have been uh, credited with three. Yeah. Uh, so there aren't many people who scored a hat trick at Wembley and lost, you know. But but we ended up losing that game, uh, which again was a, a big disappointment for me because um, you know leading City out at Wembley and not winning again, yeah. you know, is a, is, is a, a, a bit of disappointment, really. Sure. So that campaign proves to be your final one, Paul, after 11 years with the club. You, you're due a testimonial also. Future City boss Howard Kendall comes calling for you. How did that move come about? And was it an option to stay at City or did you know you'd be moving on? Well, I just signed, I just signed a one-year contract at City, actually. I was, uh, I was 32 um, at this stage and... Um, I went on holiday with the uh, with uh, the family because we had young children then. So we we just went to uh, uh, the Salt and Sands Hotel in Devon. We didn't uh, we didn't go abroad with the kids in those days. Uh, and I got a phone call from Jimmy Frizzell at, uh, in the in the room at the Salt and Sands, and uh, and he said um, Howard Kendall's been on, and uh, they've offered sixty five grand, and I think the club are uh, happy to accept it. Well. It would be because the next year, if I'd have seen my one-year contract out, I'd have been 33 years old and I'd been at the club over 10 years. So that would have entitled me to a free transfer. So it was good business on the club's side because they got 65 grand that they wouldn't have got a year later. Uh, and um, and also they had Andy Hinchcliffe coming through the ranks who was a, a top, top young player as well. Yeah. Like, you know, so... Um, but I, I, uh, I said to Frizz, well, look, I said, I'll speak to Howard, um, give him, uh, give, give me his number and I'll, I'll talk with him. And Howard sort of said, well, you know, I want, I want you to sign. We've got a problem uh, at left back with uh, Pat van der Nauer had an injury, a long term injury. Neil Poynton had a, had a problem with his knee. So he said, uh, I, I want you to come here. Like, so, um, I said, well, look, I'm, I'm in the middle of a family holiday uh, and I'm, I'll come and speak to you on Friday afternoon. So I went, I drove to Belfield and uh, I went in and he said, um, OK, he said, uh, tell me what would stop Paul Power signing for Everton today. Like, you know, so I said, well, this was this was June the 27th about and I was due um, a loyalty bonus in my contract at City, okay. um, which was a considerable amount of money for me. Uh, and I was due that on July the 1st, so in four days' time. So I said, well, I won't be signing for you today. I said, because I'm due this loyalty payment, like, you know. So he picked the phone up and spoke to Billy McNeil, who was away with um, Scots Scottish BBC in the World Cup in South America, like. And uh, I don't think Billy McNeil knew I was in the room, but Howard said, well, I believe Paul's entitled to a loyalty bond, but he'll get that, won't he? Said, We're only talking four days. And Billy McNeil said, no, no, I don't think our chairman will give him that loyalty right. bonus, um, you know, unless he's there on July the 1st. So Howard said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do then. Everton will pay Paul Power uh, for being loyal to Manchester City for 13 years. So, and then put the phone down. So I thought, oh, I like, I like him, like, you know, he's... Nice fella, this Howard Kendall. Anyway, then then he said, anything else? So I said, well, I've had two testimonial games cancelled uh, against Manchester United. Ron Atkinson had agreed to play the game, but then the Bradford fire happened and then there was tr a trouble at a Leeds game where somebody was stabbed and uh, and the police just wouldn't police a, a City v United okay, game for yeah. a testimonial. So that so those had been cancelled. So I said to him, "Well, I'm due a testimonial." And he said, "Well, I'll tell you what. Everton will play Manchester City in your testimonial game pre-season. You play half for City and half for Everton." So I thought, well, "I like it even more now, like you know." Yeah. So, and then of course he offered me terms at Everton which were uh, better than the terms I was on at Man City, and it is me at 32, nearly 33 yeah. years old. He's pulling out all the stops to get you, Paul, so you must have felt well, yeah. massive, massive. So, Straight away, I'm thinking, 
he, re, he must really want me to sign here. Like, you know, anyway, uh, I uh, I had a I had a, a medical with the club doctor who he'd arranged to be there. And uh, the doctor said to me, he said, uh, do you drink? Do you like a drink? And I said, well, I said, I don't mind. I, I like a social drink, but he said, well, you better learn to drink if you sign for this club. <laughs> you know, this is a club doctor. Yeah. Uh, so, so, and it was right, you know, because uh, they were, there was a, a great, uh, atmosphere in the dressing room, people like Peter Reid and uh, Kevin Ratcliffe, Dave Watson, you know, the, the Dave Watson from Norwich, that is, yeah. uh, and uh, Sharpie, Adrian Heath, Paul Bracewell, you know, all really... Well, they, they were a top top team, Paul, weren't they? At that time, they were winning cups, winning titles, and you obviously go on to win a title with them that season. And yeah, I don't yeah. think there's a well, City fan who wasn't pleased for you that you did. I was flattered. Go- oh. I was flattered to go there, you know what I mean? Uh, I was flattered to be asked to go. And, and as it turned out, I, I played 40 games that season for yeah. Everton and we, did, and we did win the championship, yeah. And you scored at Main Road, I believe, for Everton. How did that feel? Well, I got I got a, a bollocking. I, I never got told off by uh, Howard Kendall, but that particular day I scored. And it, it, it was an Albertozzi sort of situation. Perry Suckling was in goal. And uh, it should have eaten the shot, really. But anyway, it went in. And of course, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm right in front of Mick McCarthy and uh, and uh, Kenny Clements, Neil McNabb. These had all been my mates the season before. Sure. I couldn't go flailing my arms around, uh, you know, um, sort of. Uh, I just couldn't do it in front of them. So I, I just put my head down and jogged back to the halfway line. And uh, when I got, when I got in the dressing room, Howard Kendall came in and he said, hey, when you score for Everton and you play for Everton, you celebrate. So I got a bollocking off the manager uh, for, for, for not celebrating, but my reasons were genuine. You know Absolutely. what I mean? It was, uh, it was just one of those things. Well, I can ask you a couple of favourites. You can answer them. One word only is absolutely fine. They might put you on the spot a little bit, so feel free not to answer. So favourite City teammate. There's been a few my favorite, city teammate. My favorite city teammate. Yeah, who jumps out? Uh, was was uh, Kenny Clements? City goal might be an obvious one. That. Uh, yeah, well, that that would I tell you actually, the, uh, the goal that I scored against Everton in the replay of sure, the quarter final, yeah. when Dennis Stewart put me through on goal and I was through one on one with the keeper. And I just knew exactly what I was going to do. You know, like people say that they're in the zone. Well, I was in the zone when I was uh, when I was running the ball up, and I just uh, curled it round with my left foot into the inside post, and uh, that was the goal that gave me the most satisfaction. Although the goal that gave me acclaim as a city from city supporters was obviously the uh, uh, the semi final goal against Ipswich. Favourite City kit, Paul? Which shirt brings to mind? That one behind you, I loved it. It was uh, was a bit like the AC Milan kit. Um, the black and red stripes, uh, I always uh, felt good in it. So, favourite non-playing staff member at the club? That's a, that's, a, that's a difficult one because I've already said that I like Malcolm Allison because he gave me the captaincy. I liked... I liked um, Tony Book because he signed me. Uh, I liked John Bond because he gave me a rise. <laughs> um, so, so my favourite non-playing might might even be uh, Roy Bailey, the physiotherapist. And very good at head tennis, I believe, Roy Bailey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Left footer as well, like you know. So, uh, uh, but he he was also he lived next door, but one he he was a neighbour of uh, Julie, my wife, like you know. So, uh, so we we uh, we used to drink in the in, in the lively lobster pub in Sale, and uh, and uh, Roy had been there with his dad and his brother, like you know. So, yeah, we got on well. Favorite away ground to play at Tottenham, even though. 
you know, I, I should say Aston Villa because I, I made my yeah. uh, I made my debut there and then scored that goal there. Yeah. But uh, I always enjoyed playing at Spurs. Like you know, um, um, don't ask me why. I just did. Uh, position: left back or left midfield? Uh, left midfield because I was more likely to score goals from there, and that's what uh, everybody wants to do. Favorite current City player. Um, Roberto Silva. I love him to bits. He he uh, he runs his socks off. Yeah. He gives you everything. He's got awareness. He, he he's he's uh, he's got goals in him as well. Uh, I think he's uh, he's a tremendous asset to the squad. And he he's rarely left out. I think Pep thinks he's a top top uh, provider as well. Yeah. So who's the most talented player you played with during your spell at City? The most what, sorry? Talented. Oh, um, there have been quite a few. Uh, I mean, Asa Hartford was a real talented uh, midfield player, good pass with the ball. Uh, probably didn't score enough goals for a midfield player, but uh, I'm going to say Trevor Francis, um, because when he got through one-on-one with the keeper... There was only one outcome ever, you know. He was uh, he was a top goal scorer. Never, never, ever bothered when the opposition had the ball. You know, he wasn't like Russian Dalglish who would uh, who would close the back four down. Trevor, when the opposition had the ball, Trevor wasn't interested. Yeah. But I I was quite happy to do his running for him in that situation because I knew he'd win my bonus money for me at the end of the game, like right? because he's such a good finisher. Yeah. Kazu Dana, as well, who I've already mentioned, was a top, top professional, good good footballer. So, Paul, you mentioned you're, you're in France now, you're retired. Do you get back to City much? Do you get back home to Manchester? Well, my son works for Manchester City now. He's, uh, he's in, in charge of administration for the under-23s. Um, so he's not a coach or a, or a player, uh, but I'm absolutely proud uh, to see the, the power name sort of continued at, yeah. at, uh, at City, if you like. When I go back, I can always go to games with him. Um, but uh, I don't get back that often, really. I've just I've just been back uh, for a month at Christmas. But, of course, with the World Cup, there's been very few yeah, games. games. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, uh, I do get invited back to games and uh, uh, sort of go on the stage and do question and answer stuff at... Uh, Half time and that, and I enjoy it. It's a very different Manchester City these days. Unbelievable. I mean, even when I was working for the academy under Jim Cassell, um, you know, we had about probably uh, about 15 to 20 members of staff. That's including the recruitment department, physios, <laughs> uh, doctors, coaches. There'd be about 15 to 20 people on the Christmas party. Uh, Nicky, who works there now, my son, um, they went on their Christmas party, last Christmas party, and there were uh, 80, 80 people plus <laughs> that worked at the academy. So it, it, it's a massive change. The investment in the academy is uh, unbelievable. I, I do believe when, when we were there under Jim's charge, you know, people like Sean Wright Phillips and uh, 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 Johnson, Willow Flood, yeah. Joey Barton, Mika Richards, Richards. Yeah. Nader Monowa. You know, like, all these players uh, came through into the first team and went on to have great careers. Uh, and I, I, I think we did a great job under the circumstances then. Um, and I was really disappointed when it was... Uh, when when Gary Cook came really from Nike, Nike he decided to uh, have a new approach yeah. uh, to the academy, and uh, it went from a, a football base to more a business base. Um, but but you know there's progress for you, and now they've got some fantastic young players in this world. Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you and share your tales of blue. I wish you and the family all the very best and happy retirement in France. Uh, thanks very much indeed. It's good to speak to you. Thanks, Paul.